Howdy. All right, so normally when I talk about Logstash, I talk about how to solve specific log issues. And since this is a metric meetup, I thought I would offer some metric-related advice with respect to Logstash. Uh, first, a little bit about who I am. Uh, my tentative title at DreamHost is, is czar of logging, um, but which puts me sort of in a, in a devish position where I'm, where I'm coding on Logstash a lot of the time, uh, but also deploying it, making it provide some kind of useful value for DreamHost itself, whether that's customer data, uh, helping tech, tech support talk to the admin team and get logs out of those uh, systems. Uh, this is my first time actually being a full-time developer on an open source project, which is completely kick-ass. Uh, but my background is almost all systems administration. I've been an ops guy for a very, very long time. Um, this is one of the first times I haven't been on call, and it's awesome. So first, I want to talk about a few things uh, of interest uh, to me, hopefully of interest to you. Uh, the first thing is sysadvent. Uh, if any of you follow the Perl Advent Calendar, PHP Advent Calendar, 24 Ways to Impress Your Friends, these are all uh, projects of, the sim of similar vein. Um, Advent is a time between the, the 1st of December and the 25th of December. And a lot of times you'll get an Advent Calendar and it, you open it and you get chocolates. But in this situation you open it and you get a really delicious nugget of information, which is a very short article detailing, in this case, some kind of sysadmin related uh, task or technology. Uh, so this project will be starting up um, in about a month, right? So I have to get my shit together and get some articles done. If you're interested in contributing, please, please, please tell me. Um, I will help you write, I'll help you copy edit, whatever you need. Um, I also have stickers with this logo in the back on that table by uh, Chad with the, and the, those other guys. Another thing of interest is Monitorama. Uh, it's a monitoring focused conference. Uh, it's pretty cheap. I think the, the entry fee is like $100. It's, it's late March in Boston, uh, hopefully after they've had time to clean up after this hurricane. Uh, so first I want to start talking about like, me how metrics and logs are sort of related. Uh, and I want to propose something. Uh, but like, first, what is a metric, right? What is a log? And if you don't see those things as being the same thing, maybe I can convince you of my proposal that metrics are logs. And if, and if there's any kind of set theory to do here is that metrics are a subset. So I'll show, I'll show you an example, an animated example. These are some logs. If you're trying to read them, you've already failed the test. There's too much data here for a human really to, to glance at and get some useful, data, useful information out. But if we were to pull like a metric out of this, right? Now it looks a lot less like a log. Now it looks more like a timestamp and a piece of data, which is a lot closer to what you might interpret as being a metric. And if you turn it on its side, right, it doesn't look like a graph yet, but how about now? Right? This could be the same data. We went from logs and we basically turned it 90 degrees and now it looks like a graph. And if you do it in a modern graphing system, you'd get your log data and you get something like this. And the benefit with this thing is that the original piece of text that we had was just streams of just nonsense that you would require some kind of expertise to understand. Now you can show this to someone. They don't really necessarily need expertise because humans are good at pattern identification. They can see that there's some kind of spike there. They may not know what it means, but they identify that it's some kind of anomaly. And I'm sorry if it, it is red, so it's kind of hard to see maybe, but there is kind of a spike around 2300. And that's really powerful, right? You've gone from needing to be an expert to identify anything in that massive text of, uh, piece of text to not needing an expert to identify a problem. And I think that's cool. You've reduced the barrier to entry to identifying anomalies. So how do we get there? Most of the time, if you've been in Unix for a while, your, your first instinct may be to be like, everybody stand back. I'm going to type a kick-ass one-liner on the command prompt, and it's going to output a graph, and it's going to be amazing. And the problem with this story is that these two people here who are waiting for you to fly in and solve their problem with Perl are non-technical. And whenever you appear as a hero to someone non-technical, they're your go-to person all the time. If you ever have any family members and you're the only technical person in the family, 
They always call you for technical support, right? You're the hero. And if you're not there, suddenly they can't do anything with the computer. Now you're their primary interface to the computer. And all you're doing every day is typing in Perl, Perl one-liners, or whatever your prefer, preferable language of choice is, and spitting out graphs. And that's not what you were really, you didn't really aspire to do that, right? You're not, you didn't want to be someone's keyboard. So Logstash exists to sort of make this problem kind of easy. You start with a log, right? And you want to pull out pieces of data from it, right? As an expert, I can look at this piece of data. I can identify it's an Apache log. There's a response code 200 that you can see over on the right. And there's a byte sent. But if you weren't an expert, you would have no idea what this data meant. So with Logstash, Logstash is built with this sort of pipeline model with lots of plugins. And to solve this particular problem with Apache logs, your input's going to be a file. You're going to use a filter called grok. And you're going to output to something called statsd. Statsd is an, I'll go to the bottom of the top. Statsd is a, like a numerical aggregator. You spit numbers at it. Every few seconds, it spits out the aggregate, like the 95th percentile, the average, things like that, to another system that can record that, like graphite. And Grok is a filter to help you get from these like, really crappy plain text log formats into something that's more structured and queryable, like pulling out and identifying that 200 is the response code. And this is sort of what it looks like in the config file. Three very simple stanzas. You say input file, the following path, use the, use the following Grok pattern, and you output to statsd. And if you haven't, uh, have you guys all, you guys know about statsd? I don't want to be saying stuff and you guys don't know what I'm talking about. I see a few nods mostly. OK, cool. If you're confused, just shout out. I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. But I think the power, whoo, almost died. All right. Uh, I think the power from this system is that you go from, you can keep the input and the filter the same, but you can change the output to go to ganglia instead. Maybe you already have a ganglia install. Maybe you don't know what statsd is, and maybe you don't care. You just want to get metrics from Apache into ganglia. Or how about graphite? How about Librato? How about OpenTSDB? Right? All with only changing a very small portion of your config. And the real power here is not that you can necessarily just swap out outputs. It's that there's just lots of plugins. You can read from files. You can read from network devices. You can re read from Syslog, there's a bunch of filters. Grok is one of them to be able to parse things out. If you want to annotate events, you want to add your own features to events, uh, there's a GeoIP filter that lets you take an IP address and get some location information, which is kind of cool. There's lots of outputs. I think there's like 43 outputs now. Uh, so chances are, if you need to glue two systems together that aren't speaking the same language, Logstash can help you with that. So as an aside, uh, what are sort of the problems that you, can, you can, whoop, that you can solve with this? And I start this with a rant. Does anyone know what this is? It's a timestamp. Does it have, a na does it have like a, a specification, a name? Epoch time? What time zone is it in? UTC? It's defined in UTC, but I've seen applications that output in local time. They're wrong, but they still do it. <laughs> What's wrong with this one? No time zone. Uh, the plus was a time zone, but I only know that because I, un I understand the time format. That plus zero, zero, zero is offset. There's no microseconds or subsecond values, right? If you run a web server and you have more than one request per second, you can't identify how far apart those were. This one has duplicate information, right? It says Friday. Any computer with a calendar can identify that November 1st, 97 is a Friday. Also, no subsecond values. What's wrong here? No year? What year was it? We don't know. No time zone. How about this special flower? <laughs> Any of you guys use MySQL? Can you tell me which one's the year? How about this one? And my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is only seven different time formats. I mean, the likelihood that you have 
30 different time formats on, on, a, on a single server is extremely high, let alone multiply it across all of your systems. And the problem with this is ultimately that you have events from lots and lots of different sources. And if you try to try and correlate, you have to do that swing through the room and type some Perl on a keyboard to try and move all of these timestamps into a single format. So the, the whole point of Logstash's filter engine is to undo bullshit and poor decisions like this. So there's a date filter that you give it a format of the timestamp, and it parses that into something common and uses that for all, all time, all events. It happens to use ISO 8601. It's a time standard. Uh, the benefit here is that most languages have or ship with things to parse it. This is what it looks like in Logstash to turn MySQL times or MySQL time into something better that you can use against all your events. And this is, this is useful if you're trying to output to something like RD tool or Graphite that have like a timestamp associated with a metric. Another problem solved by Logstash is the fact that humans would identify this as one event, right? Four lines, one event. One thing went wrong. A lot of log processing systems say new lines are a terminator. Well, Logstash does too, but it comes with a filter to help you identify how each line is related so it merges into one event. So that if you're searching for fancy pants exception, you figure out what line that came from. Here's another example of something cool, and you can barely read that, uh, that you can do with Logstash. This is taking Apache logs and Apache will let you get the duration of each request. And I happen to call that duration USAC, microseconds. The minimum value of that is negative. My request took less than zero seconds. I don't have a time machine. What? So I went to look into this further. I asked, show me any, any machines down here that have a duration less than zero seconds. And there's a couple of them. And it turns out. You look at the code, and Apache uses get time of day, which is roughly the equivalent of looking at your watch to figure out timing. And it's, it's, it's not a necessarily a dumb way to do it, but you can, you're saying, OK, I'm writing down the start time when I look at the watch. The problem is that some of these servers that we have have bad hardware clocks on them. So NTP is trying to slow down the clock to keep it, or slow it down or speed it up to keep it in time with the rest of the world. But sometimes the clock is just bad. So it just has to jump in time. And when it does that, it jumps backwards, and you get a negative request time. So these are things I didn't even know existed. And just having the data in Logstash made it very easy to find out that there was a problem. So it solves some serious problems. But how about something not so serious, such as Bieber versus Gangnam? So again, lots of plugins. There's a Twitter stream plugin. And we're going to watch the keywords Bieber and Gangnam. And we're going to output it to Elasticsearch, which is a very awesome open source tool that Logstash recommends. So the main thing here is we're going to, the, the main demo here is that we're shipping data from Twitter into Elasticsearch. And we're going to render it using a custom function I wrote in, in Graphite. And the interesting thing about this is that the data graphed here is not coming from, if you use Graphite, it's not coming from Whisper or an RD file. It's coming from a, query, a live query against a database. So here's the, here's the, the tweet rate of Bieber versus Gangnam. But it's a little noisy, right? There's lots of spikes. There's, there appears to be lots of little data points. And the cool thing about Graphite is there's a lot of functions you can do to your data once you have it fetched, such as smoothing it out with a moving average. That makes it a little bit easier to, to digest. But I really want to say like Bieber versus Gangnam, right? And how do you do that? You compare the, the, two, metri the two, uh, two time series sort of directly, right? And you can do that by dividing the series. And you get a ratio. So anytime it's above 1, Gangnam is being mentioned more frequently. Anytime it's below 1, Bieber is being mentioned more frequently. So this is a very easy thing to see. And the point here isn't necessarily that we can graph shit from Twitter, because that's not necessarily the most interesting thing. I'm, it is fun. But you could look at overlaying logs from MySQL saying my disks are hosed with request times from your application servers, which you may already have in Graphite, but you have the, the system logs in Logstash. Now you can view them on the exact same display, overlaid on top of each other. And I think that's very powerful. So here's another example using real data. 
you can see this is, this is a graph from Kibana, the log stash, uh, web interface. And the graph below, they look pretty similar, right? There's a big spike plateau here at the exact same time. There's a spike down there as well. Same data set being rendered from Elasticsearch. So I think that's enough about mostly metric stuff. Um, uh, one of the bigger questions I get with respect to Logstash is how do you scale it? Um, and there's two ways. One is you scaling the transport, getting logs from all of your servers into some central point. Um, and the next one is scaling storage. So scaling transport, there's input and output plugins that have the same name. These include Redis, ZeroMQ, Stomp, IRC, uh, AMQP. You can use those to ship logs between lo uh, ship events between Logstash nodes. And for storage, uh, Elasticsearch is a very easily to scale um, open source full text ser search engine system, uh, and that's what those those white backgrounded screenshots we're using. Let's see. You know how I am on time? I can show a live demo. Word. I would like to not be in full screen anymore. All right, let's see if this will work. So instead of tracking Gangnam, I decided to start watching uh, hurricane stuff, because that seems like it'd be a useful source of information. And about yesterday, there was a horseman video <laughs> that went around. And let's see. Right, so can you guys all see this graph? Oh man, it's gone. Cool. So you can sort of see where critical mass happened, right? And it happened pretty shortly afterwards. Like this is an eight hour period. So within about two hours, usually the first hour hit critical mass and sort of tailed off. But you can, if you zoom in, you can see that there was like a pause. There was a calm before the storm, right? Some people noticed something, and then there was about 30 minutes. Maybe someone was rewinding their TiVo and uploading some, something to YouTube. And if you look at this particular time window, it's a couple of people having watched live news being like, holy shit, there's a guy in a horse mask running down the street. <laughs> and then some time passes, and eventually you, you get links that show up. Right? These are people either linking to news articles or the actual video itself. So these are things you may not need to know, but you can know because you have all this data in a system that lets you view it in a way that is understandable to humans. I don't have to be an expert on exactly when Twitter does things. I don't have to be a social media ninja. I'm just looking at events plotted over time. So let's look at another example. Let's see. Let's look at Apache logs. So the web interface here lets you do more than just search. It lets you do analytics on fields in every event. And you maybe can't see it down there, and I'm having trouble scrolling. So down here, it says, based on the log type, there's type Twitter and Apache. And there's a lot more Twitter events than there are Apache events. But if I just want Apache events, I can see people accessing my site. Maybe group it by domain, or look at, let's look at country. All right, I'm not doing anything fancy here. This is just using very vanilla log stash stuff. I mean, I'm getting a breakdown of by country who's visiting my site. Pretty useful. Didn't have to do any effort there. All right, a lot of this power comes for free, and you just explore things. And you notice I haven't typed a search query in yet. Right? I'm mostly just pointing and clicking. I'm saying, I want to see a breakdown of, for example, client IP addresses. Do a score on it. I mean, these are very simple things for like, you to intuit to say, like, I would like to see a grouping of client IP addresses. You don't have to learn SQL. You don't have to learn, like up here, there's a very small input box for the search syntax. You don't have to learn. Because I can just say, well, I know this one's the most popular. I'm going to search on just that and see all of the things it's fetching from my site. Pretty useful. So I think that's a sufficient demo, including 
doing metrics related things. You don't have to necessarily ship everything to Elasticsearch. If all you want to do is pull metrics out of your logs and dump them into whatever your metric store is, then Logstash is perfect for that. You don't have to write any crazy ass one-liners. There's a great community building around Logstash so that if you have a question about how to process something, it's very likely someone already has the solution written for you in a way that you can read tomorrow, unlike really giant one-liners that you may have written today. Right? One of the symptoms of that problem is you write a one-liner and it works and it generates some pretty graph, but tomorrow you have no idea what it does. You know it might input some certain log and it outputs a graph, but everything that like the code that it represents that, you, it's hard to read, right? Because you weren't focusing on uh, maintainability. So with respect to maintainability and, and, and function and things like that, I want to talk a little bit about what I, want, what I have Logstash sort of focusing on. And the, the number one feature is that it, it aims to be able to transport and process events to anywhere from anywhere in any format, right? JSON, plain text, protocol buffers, whatever you have your logs in, whatever you need your data out else, elsewhere, Logstash should be able to provide you a way to do it. And the second feature is once you have this pipeline to process your data, it should be able to provide you a good way to do search and analytics. And the web interface and that demo I just showed is exactly a way to do it. A design note, and, and given, and this comes from my background as being a sysadmin, is uh, I don't like finding out a piece of software that might solve a problem for me, but to try it out, just to even prototype Will it work for me? I have to do a bunch of engineering effort. I have to read a bunch of documentation. I have to understand a bunch of things. I think that's a big, it's, a, it's not necessarily a waste of time, but it is a consumer of time. There's not an infinite number of hours in a day. So with that respect, I want Logstash to be able to fit your infrastructure. Your mean time to prototype should be small. If it's not small, that's a bug. And you should come and find the community and ask for help. And also, when you, go to, when you get past the prototype phase, you shouldn't have to completely re-architect everything just to make Logstash work for you. And on a similar note, uh, there, I said there are about 80 plugins. Uh, there's more coming every, we get about three or four a month now, uh, just from random contributors, and that you it's very extendable. If you have a system that maybe you have an internal metric system, and you have a bunch of logs. Logstash should be able to, if you write a very few number of lines of code to write an output plugin, you should be able to merge all of your log data into whatever system you need to do. And this is one of the most important points, I think, with respect to any open source community, um, is that if you show up, try and use a project, try and use Logstash, and it's not working, you're doing, you, you feel like you're doing something wrong, that is a bug. That is a bug in either the software or it's a bug in the documentation. Um, I've had enough interactions with some open source communities where you show up and you ask for help and one of two things happens. One, you get rained upon by people who know more than you about the project and call you an idiot. And that's not inviting. That doesn't help grow the community. It doesn't make you want to get involved. And the other one is maybe you've identified a bug. Maybe you identified a problem in the documentation. They say, well, send patches or die. You know, just I don't care what you do. Just don't bother me. Send me a patch. And I think that's crappy as well. And that leads into, I think, contributions being more than code. I mean, I, I, can, I feel for myself that I am competent at programming. I don't, on the other hand, know all of the bugs that there are in Logstash. I don't have all of the ideas for features and things that you could solve with Logstash. So it, it's more important to me that people are able to, say, file a bug without fear of the community raining down on them and telling them they're an idiot. Uh, so that's the community I'm trying to help build here, uh, is, it, is an open, inviting one in that if you, if you have any skills to contribute, that you are able to contribute those skills, not necessarily programming. So in closing, uh, get your stash on. I have also log stash stickers in the back. Uh, Logstash.net is the main website. There's email and IRC support, as well as a ticket system. Um, code is also on GitHub. Thank you, GitHub. Yeah, cool. That's it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. So uh, one question for you about the Elasticsearch integration. Um, scaling that, you know, and right now it's been a node client basis. Do you think that uh, going forward, you know, the transport client will be a, um, a better way to scale it, or continue on the node client?
So the question was, with respect to scaling how Logstash writes to Elasticsearch, uh, I have an answer for you. Somewhere. So to answer your question in a technical sense, yes, we should allow Transport Client. On the flip side, there are three Elasticsearch output plugins. One uses the native Java API. One uses the HTTP interface. One uses what Elasticsearch calls a river, which basically, in this case, lets you stream events into AMQP, and Elasticsearch pulls them out. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, everyone kind of um, can have their own way of consuming it. Thing like high volume, if you have like, say, a weird number, like 4,000 hosts, you don't necessarily want to centralize that through uh, you know, an MQ system. You want all of them to scale the graphite, I'm sorry, uh, Elasticsearch system independently, how to do that the most efficient without having to worry about you know, different implementations of HTTP clients being better or worse performance than the other system. Sure, yeah. I, I think, um, in general, how do I scale for my particular situation? I think that's always going to be a question that merits like, sitting down and writing down your requirements, and we can figure out like, how to scale that for you. Uh, like, the community is really good with that, because there's a lot of expertise these days. Um, and if there's not a plugin that works for you, it's easy to write one. And not necessarily that you have to write one, but you could propose the idea of having one, and someone might write it. If you have control over your application, uh, I'm curious if you'd recommend um, going directly from your application into some of the various inputs or, or logging to disk and then, you know, all, like always kind of just having your application log to disk and then use log stash to... Yeah. So uh, I think it depends on the situation. If you have control over the application, that's possibly the best case. Um, the, certainly the simplest is having it write to a file and then log stash or something else come along and pick it up. Um, where was I going with that? Writing to, oh, yes. So part of the problem with uh, owning the application is you might, might not necessarily be the author of the logging library that you're using. And maybe the logging library that you're using only supports outputting to files. And that's kind of a, a, a crappy proposal to think that, well, maybe let's just log to, to Stomp or let's log over HTTP. But you don't you have to do that engineering effort. There's not a lot of logging libraries that are pluggable in a way that, like Log4j, for example, is they have all kinds of different writers and things like that. Um, so, that so that will vary. Uh, I think maybe to answer your question best is um, I like writing files. Uh, writing to disk is, is a known problem. It's, it's the, doing the math for how that's going to scale and how that's going to fail. It's, there's, there's a lot of data and expertise around that, as opposed to, to writing to the network. Um, you, you probably want to write reliably to the network, right? Uh, what I see a lot of developers do when they're thinking about logging over the network is they say, well, TCP could block. So because I don't want my log, my log call to block, I'm going to use UDP. And once you use UDP, you're in a, situ you're in a weird situation that you're going to find out, oh shit, happens too late. What happens is when there's, a lot, when there's a problem with your application, it's ten, gonna tend to log more things more quickly because it's failing most of the time, right? If your database is down, your, your, your web server is gonna be logging lots of exceptions because it can't talk to the database. Well, UDP is not a reliable data transport. So you're gonna flood the network and you're gonna start losing lots of data. You're gonna get parts of exceptions and that sucks. So I have two recommendations. One is if you control the application, don't log in your critical path. Right, write, log to a queue and have a separate thread or separate process dump that out to the network. That way you can sort of control the barriers of things that will block your application. And then just pick a protocol that works best for whatever your needs are. If you already have a Stomp broker deployed, then use Stomp. If you don't know what Stomp is, maybe don't try and learn it. Try and like, there's, there's lots of other things. Um, there's AMQP, there are, there's IRC if you want to use it. Uh, Log4j, you can write directly from Log4j into Logstash. Uh, Redis, RELP, Amazon SQS. I mean, there's lots of network-based uh, event inputs for Logstash. So you have lots of options. And the, the, asking the community is a good, is a good way to, to get some feedback about, if you don't have any particular transport in mind, send an email to the mailing list and see like, well, what did you guys do? What did you, specifically, what did you hate about 
you know, did you try something and you hated it because it was operationally insane to manage, right? Those are the things that you really want to, want to avoid, right? I think I answered your question. Sweet. Anything else? No? Cool. Thanks for having me, guys.